Today's motion is, India will become a global superpower in the next decade. We will start the initial poll now, and you should see that on your screen. While you vote, let me outline what we are debating today. 2023 has been a showcase year for the famously complicated India. It has surpassed China as the most populous country. It hosted the G20 summit. It landed on the moon. It signed off on six new members to the BRICS grouping. And it also currently dominates the Cricket World Cup, which it is also hosting. Under Prime Minister Manarendra Modi, India has made a point of actively shaping the global order and not just being a part of it. Despite persisting domestic issues, from economic equality to shrinking civil liberties, India is really thriving in its foreign relations, which in turn may help Prime Minister Modi's BJP as it gears up for elections in 2024. Under the current government, India is moving away from its historic non-alignment to what we could call multi-alignment liaising with and convening other countries in multi and multilateral formats, all across a newly re-established divide between the West and the Global South. India's new appetite for foreign relations come with an ambitious goal in mind, becoming the world's third largest economy in the coming years and emerging as a geopolitical superpower. But will India be able to deliver on that growth and ambition? Can it leverage its digital transformation and demographic dividends successfully at home and in other countries? Will China accept a superpower neighbor with whom it shares a disputed border and who continues to cooperate with its main competitor, the United States? Or will the nation's social and economic disparities prove to be a stumbling block to its growth as they have in the past? Today, we want to discuss whether India will become a global superpower in the next decade. Thank you very much for your votes. Um, I will close the poll now. Thank you very much for voting. Um, let me introduce now the teams who will be arguing in favor and against the motion today. On the side arguing for the motion, and would ask the panelists to turn on their cameras now, um, on the side arguing for the motion, first Garima Mohan, who is a senior fellow in the German Marshall Fund's Indo-Pacific program, where she leads the work on India and heads the India Trilateral Forum. Um, for, formerly based in Berlin and recently in Brussels, her research focuses on Europe-India ties, EU foreign policy in Asia and security in the Indo-Pacific. Welcome, Garima. Joining her on the side arguing for the motion is a Frederick Graf, um, who just moved to Canberra in Australia to join the National Security College. Up until a few weeks ago, he was a senior policy fellow with the Asia program at the European Council on Foreign Affairs. Before that, he also held positions at the French Ministry for Europe and External Affairs and at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. On the other side, arguing against today's motion that India will become a global superpower in the next 10 years is Yamini Ayar, who is the president and chief executive of the Center for Policy Research, an independent public policy think tank based in Delhi. And we should mention that the CPR actually celebrates its 50th birthday today. Congratulations. Yamini's work sits at the intersection of research and policy practice. She has published widely in academic publications and the popular press and writes regularly on current affairs and policy matters in mainstream Indian newspapers. And finally, joining her on the side arguing against the motion is Rafin Roy, Managing Director of ODI, the Overseas Development Institute, an independent global think tank based in London. His policy interests and research is mainly focused on fiscal and macroeconomic issues pertinent to human development in developing and emerging economies. Among other, Roy was formerly the director and CEO of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy in New Delhi. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Before we start the debate, just a quick reminder to our audience that as in all Oxford debates, the argument from our panelists that you hear may not entirely correspond to their personal views on the subject matter. We are asking them to argue for one side because we believe this helps you and us to understand the issue better. If you're a member of Asia Society Switzerland, we invite you to join the debriefing round, which starts immediately after this debate has concluded in an hour, um, to hear more of the insights of the speakers and see how their views might differ from what they're presenting in the debate. And now, without further ado, um, I'm handing over the word to Frederick Graf, joining us from Canberra, for his opening remarks, arguing in favor of the motion that India will become a superpower in the next decade. Frederick, you have four minutes on the clock. Thank you very much, and, and good evening, everybody. 
Before we embark on the discussion of whether or not India is a superpower, I think it's necessary to agree at least on some definition of what is a superpower. And we have, of course, several definition. We'll go to the sim most simplistic one. I mean, a country that has very great political and military power, uh, the idea of dominant position to more sophisticated uh, notion of what a superpower is, uh, a state that cannot be ignored, a state that can influence events and act on, policy of, on policies of less powerful nation, and so on. And if we look at the situation of India today, I believe that India is precisely in this situation. Why do I believe so? Because this notion all imply a number of things. First, the notion of capacities. If we look at the dynamic of uh, the increase of uh, India's capacities, be it in economic, military, political, or diplomatic term, over the past 30 years, the progress has been quite impressive from a country which was almost ignored on the world scene to a country which is quoted today by just everyone, quoted with aspiration of it opening its market much more, uh, quoting because everybody expects India to play uh, a, a more important role on the international scene and be a security provider, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, be they positive or negative, India has responded to those demands by simply being itself. And that itself is a sign of power and uh, substantial power. The third aspect that I would like to develop in this brief introduction is the fact that this is this notion of superpower is a very relative term, of course. It would have been defined very differently uh, 20 or 30 years ago when we had a completely bipolar world in which every was more or less signed up to align with one or the other superpower. Even then, India was not aligned. Even then, India was capable of resisting, but it then definitely didn't attract my attention when it comes to actually promote policies. This situation has changed dramatically. Today, in a world which is increasingly fragmented and polarized at the same time, where the distribution of power is much larger and more equal between countries, I mean, even the combination of China and the U.S. do not make up for 50 percent of the world GDP. That's already a substantial part of it, of course. But that allows for states like India, who are far below that, nevertheless, to play a role and be quoted on every side. And India's policy itself has allowed it to more or less not dictate its policy, but more or less pick and choose what it wants to follow on one resist on another one, and so on, which gives it complete freedom, or at least some freedom on the international scene. For all those reasons, and because India is increasingly capable of mobilizing uh, countries outside its own traditional sphere of influence, I believe that India uh, will become a great power in the years to come, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Frédéric Grau, for this opening statement arguing in favor of the motion. Um, we'll just move right along to hear the opening statement from the team opposing the motion. Um, and that statement will be delivered by Yamini Ayer joining us from New Delhi. Yamini, you have four minutes. Thank you. I'm going to answer this proposition by first interrogating the sources of India's power. Um, there is no argument that the foundational source of India's power in the world, the reason that we are not ignored, as uh, my, uh, my my opposing member uh, just said, but quoted, is for the values that we bring, not the pursuit of pure military might, but for the fact that we are a democracy, a surprising democracy, but a democracy committed to inclusion, plurality, diversity, guided by a liberal constitutional order. Um, and we are a country that has great potential and promise of economic power, a domestic market that has great potential to grow with a demography and a demographic dividend that can give us much, and the capacity to innovate for a modern service-oriented economy. We are not ignored because we have all of this. If this is strong, India is strong. 
The reason I'm arguing against the motion is because none of these sources of our power can be taken for granted today. The success of India's democracy. We say to the world that we are the mother of democracy. We are the wish for guru. But domestically, we run the risk of succumbing to majoritarianism, to pol political polarization. We are building petty, political, narrow-minded walls all around us every day. Since 2014, for instance, data suggests that lynching of Muslims, a minority community that has been at the heart of some of the critical divisions of this country, has seen a sharp rise. More importantly, we are also seeing the emergence of a new legislative dimension to this kind of petty polarization, anti-conversion laws targeted at the Muslim community. The word love jihad has entered popular discourse. Um, a Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019, which sought to bring religion into the dimensions of citizenship fundamentally going against our constitutional order. Our everyday freedoms are under stress. I, I am here speaking from an institution that's celebrating its 50th anniversary, and we have been subjected for the last one and a half years of the worst kinds of harassment from the government. What is our crime? We believe in academic freedom. We do not follow lines. We follow our research. We are our core institutions of democracy. Parliament today bulldozes laws, barely functions, prefers ceremony over debate. Um, our core institutions like the judiciary are increasingly coy over protecting individual freedoms, even matters like habeas corpus cases against preventive detention that was introduced before Article 370 was rescinded in Kashmir were unfortunately not heard by the Supreme Court. It's dragged its feet on a critical question of electoral funding and transparency to citizens only to hear the case now, four years after the initiation of these laws. India's democracy, the famous argumentative Indian today, is under stress, succumbing to the noise of WhatsApp universities. Economic growth, we are, we are the fastest growing economy in the world. We are China plus one, we are told. We are a, a country that is ending, entering into the era of the Amrit Kal to become a developed economy. But the reality is much more complicated. We are looking for foreign di direct investment to improve our manufacturing. But foreign direct investment today is only at 1.6% of GDP compared to over 3% in the heyday of 2007. Seven. Ineffective governance, insufficient infrastructure remain critical issues. Capacity utilization for manufacturing has not increased. More importantly, basic human capital, education, 50% of children that complete five years of schooling in India today can barely read a standard two text. Consequently, we are producing educated Indians who are not fit for the workforce. Unemployment is a serious crisis in India. But more importantly, for this purpose, unemployment amongst education Indians is at its highest. Educated Indians is at its highest at 20%, yet companies will complain that they are not able to hire. Finally, on our global positioning, India is in a sweet spot. India is looking to shape the, rule of the world, but it is also rather narrowly and petty-mindedly arguing against Western hypocrisy for holding us to higher standards. We say we are a civilization state that needs to shed ourselves of, bond, of the bonds of colonialism, yet we are not choosing the path of peace and prosperity. We are choosing the path of careful strategic interest. How can you lead if you're not willing to hold on to these values of democracy, the values of peace, the values of prosperity? Thank we have an opportunity. Yeah. We're not going to make it if um, we don't do you. this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yamini. Sorry for having to cut you off there. Um, very powerfully argued. Thank you so much. Um, it's now time for rebuttal. So each team gets a chance to, to also respond to the arguments of the other side. The first rebuttal, again, from the team arguing in favor of the motion, Garima Mohan in Brussels. You have four minutes on the clock as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nico, for the invitation to this debate. I will focus on the arguments made by our opponent team. And first of all, happy to note that they actually agree with us on the potential areas where India has the ability to grow and become a superpower, whether it is economic growth or diplomacy, stature in the world, the fact that India is being quoted. I think where we disagree is the, is the focus on how much values domestic strife and domestic politics will impact India India's trajectory in the international world, and I will focus on just this topic. Let's look at the sort of pattern of superpower emergence in history. And you will note that there is not a linear model or pattern that any country has followed, whether it is the United States in the 19th century, post-war Japan, or present-day China. All of them faced very different set of important domestic challenges. 
different institutional and domestic issues, and they all took very separate paths to superpower status. If you look at the United States today, there was de facto superpower. And if I ask you, what are their democratic credentials? With the Trump second term looming, um, deep problems with urban poverty, um, education system, gerrymandering, the way their political party system is set up. Um, one can also argue, looking at these domestic indices, that it how does it translate to international power and influence? What is the causal link between how can these domestic factors um, either help you succeed internationally or take you back? And I think that direct link is just not visible. Same as China. I mean, we're talking about values. What are the values China is promoting? It is an authoritarian country, both in its international and domestic um, uh, you know, behavior. And that has not changed the trajectory of the country's development. So I think while these are very important points, and one has to note them, there is no causal link between domestic politics and a necessary idea of this is the country's destiny, this is the way India is destined to go. When we look at the economic indicators, of course, a lot of um, this has been mentioned. IMF estimates Indian economy will grow by, you know, 6.3%. It's ready to surpass Japan and Germany to become the third largest economy by 2027. I think what, what we often look at is that we look at this present government and take that as the representative of India as a whole, look at their election strategy and overlook things like if you do not provide employment, if you do not harness your youth, that it's sort of you know, win or bust. And no political party has the option to ignore it. Even the BJP has increased its voting share by providing welfare services to the poorest sections of society and making sure people are voting outside their caste identities and buckets. And finally, on the question of diplomacy, I think what my opponent said is, India is basing its diplomacy on careful strategic interest versus values. I would like to ask which country is following a values-based discourse on international politics today? Look at the response of Western Europe on Israeli counteroffensive in Gaza. How many countries have used the value of protection of civilians as the basis for their foreign policy? I think if we look at how values have played. Even the European Union, the traditional champion of values in international relations, is now looking at realpolitik and geopolitics. Um, and I think with that, I would rest my case. Thank you very much, Karima Mohan in Brussels. And that brings us to the final rebuttal um, delivered for the team arguing against the motion. Ruffin Roy from the ODI. You have also four minutes on the clock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, what is there to rebut? in what my proponent for the case said, very little actually, if you define superpowers uh, in a context correctly, I think, as he said, uh, that fit the modern world. What you can therefore identify as a country being courted by almost everybody. I have two counter examples of you of failed superpowers in history who were so courted. One was Nazi Germany, and the other was the East India Company in my very own country, which spent a lot of time, effort, courting the then very powerful Mughal Empire, and we know the results. So the question to ask about a superpower is, is a country's destiny to become a superpower in the next decade or otherwise inevitable? I think not. I think not for the following reasons. Uh, when it comes to strategic autonomy, this is not a new thing for India. India always had strategic autonomy. In 1971, we liberated a neighbor in the face of the US Fifth Fleet sitting in the Bay of Bengal. I do not recall any such grand gesture of strategic autonomy in recent times. I would argue that was the apogee of our strategic autonomy. I do not recall a country being so determinedly non-aligned and therefore able to chart its own destiny in the history of the world as India has done of any major power. For the rest, in terms of the IR, India is a large country. But you know, I come from Bombay. We have a slum called Dharabi. It's very big. It's full of poor people, but a lot of poor people. And you cannot gov govern Bombay without talking to Dharabi. It doesn't mean that Dharabi, in any sense, is a superpower in Bombay. Mr. Ambani is. And therefore, I would put it to you that a large poor country with the lowest per capita income in the G20, with the inability, therefore, to exercise its strategic autonomy and influence its destiny to 
be able to prosecute to the fullest extent the three things that would give it strategic depth, which my colleague Yamini identified, is democracy, which is under threat, its economy, which is spluttering, and its state capacity, which is abysmal, is not a country that is geared to be a superpower other than in self-congratulatory terms in the next decade. Uh, my, my biggest fear is, if you ask this question another way, will India be a future superpower? I'll say yes, but many countries have always been the countries of the future. The question limited to the next decade means I have to ask, will this country that is, that is, that is flailing in terms of its exploitation of the market, in terms of its democracy, in terms of its state capacity, a country where people go to jail for years without trial, a country where people feed, where the state is forced to feed 800 million people, 800 million people, mark my words, will this country be able to fulfill its destiny in the next decade? Possibly, yes, but lots will have to change. Finally, I would like to take you through a list of names because, you know, as I said, I'm from Bombay. Bombay has Bollywood. Bollywood makes movies, and these movies either have happy or sad endings. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the trouble with uh, these, this, this superpower movie is it ends up very often with a bad ending. Roosevelt, Franco, Hitler, Stalin, Pinochet, Churchill, Gladstone, Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping. You will see a variety of endings in these movies and to use the word superpower in their context would be valid very often in terms of the definitions like my, the proposing colleague used, but perhaps you would be encouraged with this list to challenge them. A country finally that is unable to reconcile its north and south, but its largest state is poorer than Nepal, and its richest state imports both labor and capital from the north, is not a united country, and a country that has the track record of treating its women in the way it does, and does not propose to change it in any significant measure in the next decade, cannot be a superpower by my definition, and will probably not be a superpower by the more instrumental one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ratvin Roy, and that concludes the first part of our debate with opening statements and rebuttals. It is now time uh, to move into the discussion where again, we welcome also the audience's questions. Thank you to all of those who've already submitted questions. If you have a question that you haven't submitted, you can do this using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You will also see um, questions that have already been submitted. You can upvote them um, and we'll try to get those answers first that have the most upvotes, of course. Now, this has been already fascinating. I have so many questions. Frederick, you delivered the opening remarks in, uh, in arguing in favor of the motion. And I stumbled a bit on something that you said because you used the word courting a lot in your statement set. And I think you're right, right? We see how India is courted by everyone, um, by the US um, to a certain extent, by the Europeans, but also by many others. So India is kind of, I think we can probably all agree here on this call, that India is sort of experiencing a little bit of a geopolitical sweet spot um, at this time. But, you know, I, I think to, to go back to something that Ruffin uh, said in his rebuttal, that doesn't make you a superpower yet, right? So it's, it's in a way a relatively passive definition of a superpower where India, in your telling, is becoming a superpower just because everybody else sort of like needs it. And I think I, I found I found Ruffin's comparison to Darui in Bombay quite telling. And so like you can't get around that. You know, it's a place that you have to deal with if you want to govern Bombay. That doesn't make the place itself a superpower. Um, it's relevant, but it doesn't necessarily have agency. How would you respond to that? In several different things. First of all, if you want to start with the question of being courted does not give you per se superpower, I would argue that yes. And I never argue that this factor alone was the sole characterization of being a superpower. But it nevertheless gives you some bargaining power and therefore the capacity to influence. In order to have that capacity to influence, you need to have some capacity that can actually be leveraged, whether you will or not leverage them. So that's a very important factor or not. What strikes me also in this whole discussion is that we don't speak of India. We speak of Modi's India, which is not exactly the same thing. Hmm. I mean, first of all, because democracy has been under threat before. And as Garima said, democracy is not the only uh, determinant and definitely not the only determinant of power. Otherwise, how do you define a country like China? How did you define in the past a country like the USSR? So in other words, 
This is to some extent irrelevant. The capacity to influence is something else. And that's where this idea of being courted may allow India to play in a category above his own weight. That's very possible. India, by the way, has always been good as playing into, uh, for his advantage, situation of asymmetry in his disfavor, which is quite remarkable in itself. With increased capacity, it has a leverage it never had before, and is using it for its own good. I'm not saying that India today will replace or surpass China or, any, or the US. or any, This is not what we're talking about. We're talking of a country capable of influencing the game, also because the structure of the international system has changed. Now, whether internally this implies uh, drift, which are uh, probably not desirable, such as precisely as you all mentioned, uh, the dangers to democracy. There is definitely an authoritarian drift. There is definitely an identity drift as well, and so on. Nevertheless, in terms of actual power, this is not really affecting the trajectory of the country, as Garima said earlier. So, mm -hmm. I mean, let's not confuse things. If we speak of uh, superpower, we speak of the relative powers that country have over one another. Of course, there are domestic determinants of it, but not just domestic determinants. And as uh, to, to, to conclude, as uh, I started, these are those determinants that has to be, and the, by, by the way, the idea that India today is on the verge of being more fragmented than they've ever been in the past. Mm -hmm. I think that instead the examination, uh, if we go back in history, uh, there have been periods where the, uh, uh, the the fragility of the national unity was probably as threatened as it is now. And this is not a way to excuse any, uh, any drift uh, existing now. But in terms of actual power and actual capacity vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, I think that India has never been as, it, uh, as in a good position as it is now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I want to pick up what you have said, uh, Frederick. Yamini, you uh, made a very good case. And I think, you know, it's, as always, when I listen to people from CPR, it's very hard to argue because your uh, your reasoning is sound and, and, and you have to the facts and the data straight. But you did focus a lot in your arguments on democracy. And I think your opponents have a point when they say that democracy by no means is a precondition of becoming a superpower. And we might even argue that you know, when we look at China, that the Chinese superpower status has increased as its sort of democratic credentials, which are never much to speak of, uh, to begin with, have decreased over the last 10 or so years. So can you can you explain a little bit why you feel that sort of the the domestic issues on the democracy front that you see in India would prohibit it from becoming a superpower. It seems like it could, you know, sort of very well become a, a limited democracy with a strong government that could, you know, pull its weight um, on the global stage. Those two things can go together, no? What's our value proposition? We need a strong democracy because a strong democracy is our value proposition. It, it is what enables our economy to function. It is what makes us Mm -hmm. uh, a country that uh, there is a reason why we are uh, countries are looking to us. China plus one plus one emerged because China is not democratic, and you do not know very much about what's going on there. That's why you're willing to come back and give India a second chance. And there are several elements of what ensures a peaceful uh, a rule of law. Uh, uh, social order, all of that in a complex country like India, which is diverse, which has multiple ethnicities, multiple religions, requires democratic accommodation to be genuinely peaceful, genuinely effective, and for markets to do what markets need to do. So absent democracy, you're not going to be able to, in a country like India, get the kind of uh, environment that you need for ease of business that will allow the China plus one, which is the reason why we are being Supported by the world to be effective. For an economy that is in a process of transition, it needs feedback loops. You cannot grow an economy without signals from society. And when you curb all those by curbing freedom of expression, the one way in which the Indian market would operate by building on those feedback loops, chaotic but operate effectively nonetheless and become a value proposition for, for the world was through its democracy. Name me one democracy, look at China today, despite all its authoritarian 
authoritarian power and its economy. The world is looking away because it isn't a democracy. We have it, we can save it, and we can become a genuine rule framing, rule shaping power, not a petty victim looking around to see who's courting me and where can I find a little space. We can change the world. What happened to those aspirations? Thank you. Uh, Karima Mohan, I, I want to put this to you because I think Yamini has uh, in her um, statement before as well as now to put the finger on you know, sort of the, this intersection between democracy and, and, and the economy. But I think Yamini also made a few really good points where if we want to sort of continue the China comparison a little bit, and I'm aware that you know this is a flawed comparison uh, in, in, in so many dimensions that, that we won't be able to get into today. But uh, Yamini has, I think, you know, very rightfully argued that while India is experiencing high economic growth right now, there is there's so many issues remaining that you know we would probably say that China has at least been able to address uh, to a larger extent, like infrastructure development, like education. Aren't those ultimately going to be the thing, the things much more than your know, sort of clever diplomacy that will determine the country's superpower status? If it's not able to create enough jobs for its well-educated people, if it's not able to build up infrastructure to enable foreign direct investment and trade, can it really become a superpower? I mean, I think your question is flawed because that's not what I argued at all. I mean, that's that's not the counterpoint that that, that we were making. Let's start with what Yamini said about China and uh, the fact that she said that because of domestic uh, pressures in China, countries and companies are looking away. Is that the case? I sit in Europe, I sit in Brussels, and that would be music to my ears if you were to say that countries and companies are looking away from China. They are going through these like little nuances of you know how can we decouple, disengage. We run a forum where we get companies to talk to us and, and talk about their businesses in China. And even with CEOs literally getting arrested, you will not hear this from big companies in Europe and the US. We're saying we will completely move manufacturing outside of China. They are thinking of doing so because per capita income has increased in China. The, the cost of manufacturing is going up, actually, which means that you have to look at countries like Vietnam, Thailand, India, Mexico, etc. What are the democratic credentials of any of these countries? Is it, have, is it actually influencing the decision of companies where they invest? No, they're looking at what are the basic conditions that are being met. Look at the states in India, for example. Um, now, you have certain big companies, including big foundations, investing in states like Uttar Pradesh, which have a very, very spotty domestic record um, and, uh, you know, democratic record as well. Is that, you know, changing the calculus of companies? I think when we start talking just in terms of values, uh, we give a sort of rationality to actors like states and companies where they're acting on these values, but unfortunately they're acting on interests. And when these interests are looked at, the present Indian government, but also I think any future Indian government has a very good case to present um, for why you know companies should invest in India, why countries should work with India. I do think there is a certain value proposition that India gives. It's probably not that the kind of value proposition we like, but there is one, of course, this whole China plus one strategy, having companies like Apple come to India, PLI schemes, re-entering into FTA negotiations. Yes, it's flawed. Yes, it's slow. But I always feel like we always hold India to that standard, but not other countries. The European Union is equally slow. Uh, the European Union is equally bureaucratic. Uh, the European Union also has certain you know, deficits working in this case, but always with, with the case of India, we always say it is the superpower of the future, rather than looking at all the changes that have happened, all the um, indices that have been achieved, all the sort of changes that are coming. Yes, they are slow. Yes, they're clunky, but they're on their way. And I also feel like we should not just equate this particular government, but also look at what are the future changes. The electorate of India needs to be given more agency and more, more, more credit. Uh, young people who are entering the workforce and who need jobs, I feel like we are at this critical moment that no government can look away from this. And if they do, they will be voted out of power. We have elections coming up. Um, and I think that is the that is the you know advantage of working with an electoral democracy um, that you have to provide answers to these tough questions. You cannot mm -hmm. keep muddling through. Um, and I think with with sort of looking from it from that perspective, it just it, it helps you understand why so many countries are quoting India and even companies have um, confidence in the country.
Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I do want to say, you know, sort of as for your comparison with the EU, I think you know, we could have a whole separate Oxford debate on whether the EU itself is a superpower. I'm not sure everybody would necessarily agree with that, but we'll, we'll leave that for another day. Uh, Rafin, I, I want to change tack a little bit because it seemed to me that from your statement that you were very open you know, to the idea and the possibility of India becoming a superpower, which is not in the next decade, right? So you feel that that's totally something that could happen. You see the potential. I think Yamini said this as well. So let me ask you this. What, you know, briefly would have to change in the next three to four years, broadly in India's development, sort of to get it on track to sort of superpower status? So it, it seems that you're saying things are going in the wrong direction. You know, this is totally within India's capacity. Um, just not with how it's developing right now. So where are the changes that India would need to make to accelerate its transition into superpower status? Excellent question. Thank you. Let me first say that it's completely logical, uh, since I'm an economist, that the most populous country in the world and the second most populous country in the world should be superpowers, right? Because that would be 40% of the earth, and that's a wonderful outcome. So India is always going to be the next superpower irrespective of what we see or do. And that has been so, I think, you know, since 2000 BC or whenever the present government likes to call our last days of glory. Uh, therefore, I think what inhibits us briefly of our, well, let me just cut to the chase. What inhibits us is this. If I wanted to set up a museum of inequality anywhere in the world, I would set it up in India because you need an inequality and we have it in spades. As I said, and here, Garima, I differ with you a bit, UP has in fact de-industrialized in the last 30 years. And all the things that you see in terms of investments outside the national capital region have not fructified. There is no investment in the mass of UP. Forget Bihar, even forget. But the point still is that North India is poorer than Nepal and has the human development indicators of Burkina Faso. South India is almost as prosperous as Indonesia, has zero extreme poverty almost, and has upper middle income human development indicators. This state of affairs cannot exist because it's not like Europe, where you know, Northern Ireland and Greece and Portugal, which had a minority of the population of Europe, were disadvantaged. In India, the majority is disadvantaged, but they have political power and their population is increasing. And we have a large and ugly building, in my view, built in Delhi to reflect that change in population, which will mean that the poorer, less advanced, more backward, and dare I say it, more polarized and communal North and East, will have a permanent parliamentary majority against the more prosperous, more inclusive, and more progressive South. I think this is a huge challenge. This is the challenge of today, of this decade, which India will have to confront if you're even going to use that word in a singular sense going forward, let it all talk about that singular becoming a superpower. That is one. The second is that India, no country has been able to become a superpower without, the, you know, effective superpower without confronting its demons. At best, the US, when it did not have its civil rights movement, had the status of superpower thrust upon it. It was the civil rights movement that enabled the US to legitimately champion its case as the leader of the so-called free world and many other things. India has, a pro has, has several problems of inequality there. We have ethnic inequality. We have inequality of opportunity. We are a country where even the film industry is hereditary. You know, I mean, there's a limit to hereditary succession, but let it on politics. The film industry is hereditary. Film stars launch their children. And the most important impediment, I think, in India is gender inequality in all its dimensions. So I think for India to become a superpower, it is not going to happen through technocratic change. I think the country needs and has the potential, looking at our history, to have several socio-political revolutions that will create a society where people are educated, healthy, less equal in all the dimensions I mentioned, and more inclusive, and do what a superpower that differs, a superpower that I would like to live in, versus the kind of superpower that Hitler or Stanley created. Mm -hmm. To quote Star Trek, a country where people live long and prosper together. That is the destiny of India, or that can be the destiny of India, but we are not confronting those problems in this decade. And may I just point out, I agree with my uh, colleagues, India is not just Modi's India, but I live in Modi's India, and I've been doing so for some time. And it is that, I think, that is one of the primary barriers 
to addressing all the questions I'm addressing for India to achieve its superpower status. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, so we, we're already almost out of time. I do want to get some audience questions in, but I think, Frederick, you uh, you wanted to say something or did I misinterpret your, your hand gesture? Interesting. Say something. Well, which is one thing which is very briefly. Me that, sorry. Yes. One thing which strikes me is we we all talk as if there was a clear distinction between pre-Modi and post-Modi, as if India's history started in 2014. The reality is that in foreign policy, in many economic policies, actually, uh, there is a complete continuity. There has been a completely different narrative on those policies, which is very different from having different policies. It's a very interesting that, you know, both of you arguing not uh, against India becoming a superpower. You are arguing in case of the superpower that you would like to have. And I don't think we necessarily have major differences over there, but this is a very different dialogue. This is a very uh, different conversation, and I don't think that the problem is really there. Mm, thank you. Um Let's turn to some of the audience questions. There are many. Um, we're not going to be able to get through all of them, but I think we've touched on some of these subjects. One subject, uh, Yomini, I'm going to ask you this question and, and uh, asking for a, a, a brief answer, even though it's a broad question. I understand that um, it's on the India-China relationship. I've mentioned very briefly in the introduction that, of course, there are border disputes between India and China that have sort of festered for a long time that have uh, led to the Galwan Valley incident a, a few years ago. How does how do these border disputes influence the relationship between the two countries? And do you see this having also an effect on sort of India's superpower ambitions? What a superpower we have the potential to become when we don't even want to officially admit that we have a serious border crisis with, with, with China. When we have admitted somewhat perhaps inadvertently, but our own foreign minister has pointed out, they're the bigger economy, I'm the smaller economy, I have to work how to manage that. I have a trade deficit, uh, which I'm not able to reverse. Uh, those are the contours that shape India's relationship with China in fact, India's relationship with China should give us cause for pause in this whole discourse about superpower mm -hmm. when you have military might poking at you repeatedly and consistently and you don't even want to admit it domestically at a time when you've made foreign policy a domestic issue. You don't want to admit this one critical issue at a hyper-national popularized politics. You don't want to admit this because you do not have the power to effectively deal with it. Those are the contours, both militarily and economically, that are shaping our relationship with China. Thank you. Um, and uh, as a probably last question from the audience, but I really, really like this one and, and I want to and I want to ask it. So the question, um, which I'm going to shorten a little bit, is that does being accepted as a superpower as opposed to perhaps a regional power not imply offering a vision of the countries and people might want to look up? And you know, one of the examples here is China lifting millions of people out of poverty, you know, having this image of being very modern, fast, innovative, um, at least until you know, maybe recently. And the question is, you know, that uh, the questioner is failing so far to understand what vision. India might be offering to the world in that respect. Garima, what's the vision that India offers as a superpower? I think what I would like to focus on the fact on continuity in India's foreign policy that has existed in the past also with this government that just packages and brands it differently. Um, and there has always been a vision that India has offered to the world. Let's look at the G20 presidency that India had. Uh, we did a summit with Global South countries where we got 125 countries to come together and talk about what are the issues they would like to see addressed. And what came out of that summit was centering the voices of the Global South again. We were just talking about US-China competition, Ukraine, but a lot of countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia felt left out. And they looked to Delhi as um, um, you know, providing a third way in between the G2 competition. I think this is what India has to offer to the world. By not joining, I mean, we can say that we've moved from non-alignment to multi-alignment. There is a very clear foreign policy path that India has followed, even under Prime Minister Modi, that actually is a path of continuity, which is providing a voice 
for number of countries in the global south that have been ignored in the global G2 competition. I think that is the vision that India provides, and that is why you see proactive terms that India is trying to build coalitions, not just in the Indo-Pacific, but also in the Middle East, also, you know, getting the African Union into the G20, trying to manage, uh, you know, Russia and China on the one hand and the US on the other. Um, I think there are all of these moves of Indian foreign policy that certainly give a vision for India, perhaps that is not that visible from a Western context. And I I, I think the, the question asker is sort of looking at it from that perspective mm -hmm. as well, like how many people have you pulled out of poverty, et cetera. But also I think there has been a very robust tradition of India speaking for the voices of the global South that I was happy to see underlined at the G20. Um, also on the question of India and China, and the border issue. Again, I would like to underline that uh, the border conflict, there is a pretty long unresolved border. It has always been the case. Um, it did not crop up uh, now. Yes, I agree with uh, Yamini that this government has not talked about it, but every single policy decision this government has made has been to remedy exactly this. And in fact, I would argue that the India-China military border crisis is a wake-up call for India and actually might lead to India achieving its um, you know, foreign policy ambitions rather quickly because look how quickly it has pivoted towards new partnerships with the West joining the Quad, trying to rehaul its old, um, outdated military, for example, and the um, reliance on Russia, all of that is being <clears throat> questioned simply because of what's happening on the India-China border. So I do think that you could argue that this crisis is actually precipitating a lot of change that was necessary um, and very quickly. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us already at the end of the Q&A. It's now time for closing statements. So each uh, participant has two minutes to summarize their view and argue why you should vote for them in the final poll. The order is the same as at the beginning, which means that we will start with Frederic and the team arguing in favor of the motion, followed by Yamini, Garima, and finally Raffin. Two minutes on the clock, and the word again goes first to Frederic Gar, joining us from Canberra, Australia. I think what's important to consider in this discussion is we're talking about India, Jane, and not about one specific government in India. I mean, the last major shift that we did observe in India's uh, domestic and foreign policy was definitely 91-92 with the collapse of the, the Soviet Union and the need for India to change is uh, change its way. Uh, introduce economic reform, uh, change is partnership, open up to the West, and so on and so forth. This had been continued irrespective of who was in power, be it under the first NDA government, be it under the Modi government right now. Again, there has been some time a change of narrative. This hasn't been without any problem. I mean, there is a difference between seeing uh, difficulties, failures in policy even, and uh, assessing the overall trajectory of the country. On this, we have absolutely no evidence that India is going down. And if we go by the prediction of uh, foreign institutions, such as the World Bank, such as uh, we can take a, a number of index, uh, including those dealing with the domestic situation. And yes, we have a problem with democracy. Yes, we do have a problem with uh, <laughs> Uh, religion, identity, and so on. But overall, we also have a number of things which are still going in the same direction. So the overall trajectory has not been affected. India is meeting crisis after crisis. And as Garima said, this has been each time uh, an opportunity to move and in a slightly different direction, correct the previous course when it needed to be correct. But overall, we haven't seen any major change, no change of orientation in the foreign policy. Uh, a new dynamism, not a change of policy, but a new dynamism in the economic policy at the time of seeing we started to stagnate and so on and so forth. There we go. Uh, I'll leave to more qualified people than I am the the, the, the role to assess the domestic situation in India. Uh, I'm not sure that it is at a stage where it can actually uh, completely disturb the trajectory as we see it. And I'll stop my, uh, uh, my intervention here by restating that, yes, India will be a superpower. Thank you very much, uh, Frédéric Gar. And we're moving it right along to the closing statement from Yamini Ayar from the Center for Policy Research joining us from New Delhi. 
two minutes. We've been told by our opponents that we must remember that we're talking about India and not Modi's India. We've also been told by our opponents that challenges to democracy today um, are not going to stop the rest of the world from courting us. Um, and this is perhaps the, the, the main fissure. This, the difference, the reason why we are talking about democracy is because there is a widespread acceptance that regardless of whether you are a democracy, you will have the potential of becoming a superpower. The case I have been trying to make is that for the complexity of what India is and the particular kind of economy it is with all the inequalities that my uh, colleague Ratan Roy presented as well, India needs democracy in order to strengthen strengthen herself. There is no country in the world that is able to emerge as a superpower without being able to ensure that not only does it deal with its own demons, it strengthens itself and, and prepares itself to be able to shape the world. No country in the world becomes a successful superpower with all the courting that it can be given without being able to ensure these fundamental elements of itself are in place. These elements are, are, are currently being challenged today as somebody who lives in this country and is experiencing it on a daily basis when we have to talk in whispers and not talk loudly to express our points of view. Democracy is under threat. It is under stress. It is for India to be able to recognize it, acknowledge it, and re-emerge and strengthen herself. We will then become a superpower. We won't need to debate it. And it is for the rest of the world to remind us that we are a democracy because that's the reason we are being quoted. Thank you very much, Yamini. Um, and now the word goes to Karima Mohan for her closing statements arguing in favor of today's motion. Two minutes as well. Thank you. Um... The idea of India being quoted takes agency away from the country. Um, we are really, really doing a disservice to the most populous country in the world with um, very clear foreign policy and other ambitions by saying that it is simply being quoted for others for whatever reason. Global center of gravity is shifting to the Indo-Pacific. According to the Lowy Institute, over the next 10 years after China, the most important country in the Indo-Pacific to emerge in terms of political, diplomatic, military and cultural influence is India. How India wields that influence, how deftly it uses it, will determine whether it has a superpower status or not. But we simply cannot ignore the strategic shift that has taken from the Euro-Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific and the role India undoubtedly will play in this region. There is a region that there is a reason that every country from the United States, Europe, Japan, Australia, Southeast Asia, Russia, and even China to some extent is looking to, to sort of work with India and to see how it will position itself globally. Uh, this should tell you what um, role the country has for itself in the in the future. Um, and finally, we unfortunately, international relations is marked by realpolitik. Um, as much as we want values to matter, they don't really. We have no country in the world, superpower or otherwise, that has held a consistent values-based position on any foreign policy or other issue. Um, and that is simply the unfortunate reality we live in. Um, and I think that while I do agree with the opponent, opposing team that there are serious concerns of democratic backsliding in India, I do not think they will impact the trajectory the country is set to take in the next decade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karima Mohan. That brings us to our very last closing statement, Ruffin Roy arguing against today's motion that India will become a superpower in the next decade. You also have two minutes. Thank you. Let me close and take account of these arguments. And I must say, I agree a lot with what Karima just said. Uh, to make four points as to why I think India will not be a superpower in this decade, unless something very dramatic happens very soon, which I don't see on the horizon. Number one, India will not be a superpower if India tries to be like China. And that is why democracy is very important. And we must chart our own course, as Garima says, we must have agency. Uh, and therefore, every threat to democracy that India faces brings us closer to becoming a wannabe China or, uh, you know, enabling invidious comparisons with China, which briefly are not helpful. Second, India cannot be a, a superpower if India is going to become like Pakistan. That is the closest lesson I have in my neighborhood. And I'm afraid over the last 10 years, what I have seen, and which is very different from the past, is a steady movement to India becoming like Pakistan. As the Pakistani poet said, you have become just like us. 
Uh, every cry I hear of go to Pakistan reinforces that. So let me just say that to all the great superpower wishes who may support this Hindu nationalist government, India is not Pakistan. And India will never become a superpower if we continue to try and be like Pakistan. That is not a country to imitate, please. Number two, I completely agree on the point of the, about agency. So we get agency, I think, in two ways. On the, on, the, on the internal front, we get it if we can enhance solidarity and fraternity. And for the reasons I adduced in my opening statement, that is conspicuously lacking. And there was a sort of march of progress to this happening from decentralization, you know, from the Right to Information Act, etc. And I see reversals there in that continuity. So I would disagree there with Frederick. I see reversals which are impacting our ability to be a superpower by impacting solidarity and fraternity within the nation. Finally, I think there is a difference between performance and drama. What I see on the foreign policy stage is very good performance. But unfortunately, I see the government of India and the elites of India projecting drama. Drama is not a hallmark of a superpower. Boasting is not the hallmark of a superpower. That is what Franco did. That is not what Roosevelt did. And I want India to be led and perform like the United States under Roosevelt, Eisenhower, not like Franco and Salazar, which I'm afraid is the direction I see us today going on record. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rasmin Roy. Performance is not the same as drama. Wonderful statement to close on for today. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been an intense and, and very, very interesting debate. It's now time for the second poll. So we're asking the audience to vote again on the same question, namely whether they agree or disagree with the motion. I am launching the poll now, which will be open for 45 seconds. And because we've spoken so much and we've said so much today, we're going to let the audience now vote for those 45 seconds in peace and silence. And then we'll see who won. And now we are ready to see the final results of today's Oxford debate, which you should see on your screen. Here we go. Um, in the first poll, we had 50% of respondents agreeing with the motion and 32% disagreeing, um, with 18% saying no, no. The second poll had 35% uh, of people agreeing with the motion and 53% disagreeing, which means that there is a delta of plus 21% for the team arguing against the motion. So the team arguing that India will not become a superpower in the next 10 years. Yamini Ayar and Ruffin Roy has won this Oxford debate. Congratulations to the both of you. Congratulations also to Garima um, and Frederic for a well-argued debate. This has been highly, highly insightful. Thank you very much to the audience for having joined us today.